All right, so this is going to be part two of cell signaling. So we can summarize the cell signaling pathways in the following way. So we have steps. Step one, reception. Step two, transduction. And step three is going to be the actual response. So let's go through the reception area right now, and then later we'll discuss transduction and the rest of it. So reception means a signaling molecule will have to bind to a receptor protein. So receptor proteins can be embedded in a plasma membrane like you see it right here in this picture, or they can be located in a cytoplasm, so we call them intracellular receptors. No matter where they are, when the signaling molecule binds to a receptor, receptor undergoes conformational change. So that change is going to initiate transduction pathways. And also keep in mind that the binding is very specific. So in other words, the receptor has to be able to recognize a specific ligand in order to initiate that transduction. So we're going to look at um, three types of receptors, and these are present within the actual membranes. So one example is the G-protein coupled receptor. Just like the term suggests, G-protein coupled receptor means there is a G-protein, and there's also a receptor. So it means two components are going to be working together. So this, uh, these types of receptors make up the largest family of cell surface receptors. And there seems to be about a thousand of those that are known now in humans. And they play a huge role in all, in all sorts of processes that are happening within our cells, within our tissues. So I listed a few here, and you can see vision and smell, regulation of mood, behavior, regulation of immune system, embryonic development, and this is just to name a few. Okay, so the G protein acts, as I said before, as a molecular switch. So basically it can be turned on and it can be turned off. So how does this work? So if you look at this membrane right here, we have a receptor that is basically a protein and you can see there's this long polypeptide that's embedded in the membrane and it's actually spanning the membrane seven times. There's extracellular domain that's sticking out for the ligand to bind and there's also intracellular domain that is going to be interacting with the actual G protein. So now if you look closely at G protein, G protein consists of three subunits. So we have alpha subunit, beta, and gamma. So when the G protein is not active, you will notice that there is a GDP molecule bound to it. So GDP is a nucleotide similar to ADP, except that here, instead of adenine, we have guanine. So when the alpha subunit has GDP bound to it, G protein is basically inactive. So now, how do we actually activate the G protein? The ligand needs to bind to the extracellular domain of that receptor. This receptor is going to undergo conformational change and activate the G protein. For this reason, this G protein alpha subunit is going to lose affinity to GDP and gain affinity to GTP. So in other words, it's going to replace GDP with GTP. So when that exchange happens, it causes the alpha subunit to disassociate from the entire G protein, from the other two subunits, and activate the enzyme or whatever protein, or maybe even a channel that is downstream. So you can see now alpha subunit has moved away and is interacting with this protein. And alpha subunit happens to be also a GTPase, so it means it has the ability to hydrolyze the GTP. But then what it has left is GDP. So if it has GDP bound to it, alpha subunit will have to move back to its in initial position. And you can see the G protein is going to be inactive again. And then the signal can be initiated again. All right, another example of cell surface receptor would be enzyme-linked receptor or tyrosine kinase. So if you notice right here in this diagram, we have two inactive monomers. So each monomer has two domains. It has ligand binding domain, which is the extracellular part, and then it has enzymatic domain that is rich in tyrosines. So when the signaling molecule binds, the ligand binds to the ligand binding domains, notice right here, those two monomers are going to come together. So in other words, they form a dimer, and we say dimerization takes place. So dimerization is going Going to activate the next process um, and that is called autophosphorylation because this part right here has enzymatic activities 
those tyrosines here can actually take the ATP, hydrolyze the ATP, and transfer the phosphate group from the ATP to another tyrosine. So they actually do this, what we call cross autophosphorylation. So each tyrosine now will have a phosphate group attached to it. So why is this important? Because this part is going to be very reactive because if you remember the functional group of the phosphate, we have phosphorus and the four oxygen atoms around it and oxygens are highly electronegative. So those functional groups are going to be highly reactive parts. For this reason, we can go to step four and you're going to see how those those parts uh, of, the, of this particular enzyme are going to activate other relay proteins have been, that are sitting downstream and, you know, in this phosphorylation cascade. And then eventually we can trigger a specific cellular response. Um, another example of cell surface receptor would be ligand-gated ion channel. So what we have here is a signaling molecule, notice, is binding to a channel, which is normally closed, but when the signaling molecule is binding it, it causes this channel to change shape, and it changes the shape in such a way that it opens up and allows for the fusion of ions. And you can see, of course, those ions are going to trigger a particular cellular response. So for example, if we have calcium that's been diffusing, calcium is required for muscle contraction. And then if we remove this, the ligand from the actual channel, notice the gate is going to close. So it means we actually prevent the flow of ions. The next category of receptors that we want to address um, is basically intracellular receptors. So we mentioned that in the beginning of the lecture, and we said that these receptors are found in the cytosol or the nucleus. So here's an example. We have a hormone. And hormones are known to be small, hydrophobic, and they can actually, nonpolar, they can actually diffuse right through the membrane, right through the phospholipid bilayer. That's why their receptors are going to be found within the cytoplasm, or they can even be in the nucleus. So in this case, we see that the hormone is diffusing through the membrane, binds to the receptor protein, forms a hormone receptor complex, and then this complex is going to move all the way into the nucleus. And this receptor part has DNA binding domain. In other words, it recognizes a specific gene within your DNA, binds to it, and initiates transcription. So it's going to recruit all the other proteins to the scene to initiate transcription. It doesn't really work alone. But the, po the point is, is that this particular uh, receptor protein can actually act like a transcription factor, and it turns on the gene. And you can see now the result is the production of mRNA molecule. So it means the gene has been transcribed, and then mRNA leaves the nucleus, lays down between the ribosomes, and the translation process begins. And the result of translation is the synthesis of the new protein. So now the protein accumulates within the cells and going to give you specific characteristics. So in this case, the hormone was testosterone, so it means it's a male sex hormone that's going to produce all the proteins that are going to be put together to sort of give males uh, the male physical uh, features. All right, I'm going to stop right here and I will see you next in transduction.